Now, we left off uh, Thursday night with Jesus rising from the dead. And the best I can tell, you know, my opinion is that Jesus rose from the grave sometime which would have been our Saturday evening or our Saturday night, which would have been their Sunday. Because their day, their, their day ended and the new day began at dark. All right, so that's what my opinion is, was that Jesus rose from the grave again sometime on our Saturday evening or Saturday night. So, which would have been their Sunday. Now, Mary Magdalene and several other ladies are coming early that Sunday morning to anoint the body of Jesus. And we talked about why last reason, I'm, last Thursday. I'm not going to get into all that. But they, they are actually coming at dawn, the Bible says. So that Sunday morning at dawn. And the Bible says he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And then this, I'm just going back and kind of touching on where we left off. And it said she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. So Mary Magdalene was the first person to see Jesus. She has to tell somebody about it. She can't keep it in. She goes and tells them. And we talked about why, you know, my personal opinion was Mary was privileged. Why Mary was one that was privileged to see the risen Savior, first of all, the first one in the history of the world to preach the good news about the risen Savior. And, and I personally believe that it was because Mary, you know, she had seven devils, specifically told her she had seven devils. So obviously she had been forgiven for a lot of stuff. All right, so the Bible talks about how, who, whom is forgiven much, loveth much. So I think Mary, Jesus knew that Mary, would, Mary was a very appreciative of the fact that she had been forgiven. She was saved by grace. And she wasn't going to take that grace for granted. She was going to do something with it. So I believe one of the reasons why Jesus probably revealed to Mary first was because Jesus knew as a good saved woman, she would have a no problem telling somebody about it. And that's exactly what she did. She starts spreading the good news immediately. Look at verse 11. So that's kind of where we left off uh, Thursday. Let's get into it here now in verse 11. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them, as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians 15.3. 1 Corinthians 15.3. So we've already seen Jesus has appeared to Mary Magdalene. We just saw where Jesus appeared to two more, and he's fixing to appear to the 11 apostles. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is a good verse about a lot of his appearances. Very good verse here about, about all of Jesus' appearances. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to scriptures. And that was the gospel. We just read the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas. Now that was Peter. That was uh, Peter. Anybody ever heard, know who both Cephas is? <laughs> Hank, that's what Hank, I guess Hank Williams Jr. was named after uh, Peter here. That's Hank Williams Jr. named both Cephas. It says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve... And after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Over 500 eyewitnesses at one time, of whom the greater part remain in his present, but some are falling asleep. And, and what he's saying here is, it's like, look, Jesus was seen of over 500 eyewitnesses at one time, and they're still alive today if you want to go talk to them about it. They're still alive today if you want to go down there and ask them about it. They'll tell you all about it. Now, some of them have died. Some of them with the Lord now. They fall asleep. But these are still, they still remain alive today. You want to go talk to them about it. Verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, look. With all those eyewitnesses, I want you to know that the resurrection, even if it was just two, 
with all those eyewitnesses, the resurrection of Jesus Christ would hold up in any court in the world. It, it, two witnesses would have been enough. But he had over 500 at one time, not including all the others. Now look, <clears throat> guess what? If he resurrected, and these people saw him resurrect, then that means he had to exist. All right? The point I'm trying to make is, nobody can disprove the fact that Jesus Christ walked this earth. Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawking, I don't care, you name the atheist, you name the skeptic, you name the uh, intellectual, and nar nary a one of them, not nary a one of them, can disprove the fact that a man named Jesus walked the face of this earth. Now, there's been more books, more songs, more lives have been changed about this man named Jesus. And look, because of the eyewitness testimonies that we just talked about, because of the eyewitness testimonies, because of the calendar system, A.D., B.C., because of the historical evidence, Nobody can disprove the fact that Jesus Christ lived. Now many will want to say, well, yeah, Jesus lived, but he was just a good teacher. Yeah, Jesus lived, but he was just, you know, he was just another prophet. Jesus, yeah, a man named Jesus lived, but he was just a good moral man. He was just a good teacher. That's, that's false. Okay? Because good teachers don't lie. Good moral men don't lie. Now, Jesus claimed to be more than a teacher. Jesus claimed to be more than... He was a prophet, but he, was all, he claimed to be, be more than a prophet. He was more than just a prophet. He was more than just a teacher. He was God in flesh. Now, with the claims that come out of Jesus' mouth, you may have heard it said, Jesus can only fit in one of three categories. Jesus can be... A lunatic, a liar, or Lord. Has anybody ever heard that saying before? He can be one of three things. He can be a lunatic, a liar, or Lord. You know, Jesus could be a deranged lunatic like uh, David Koresh. Or he could be a liar like Jim Jones. Or he can be Lord. And we know that when Jesus rose from the grave, he proved that he was Lord. Amen? So... You know, these, these skeptics are going to have to decide what they're going to do with Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus, Mr. Hawkins? What are you going to do with uh, Mr. Dawkins? What are you going to do with Jesus, Mr. What is his name? Stephen Haw Hawkins? What are you going to do with Jesus, Mr. Hawkins? He's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. Now, I, I claim that he's Lord. I know he's Lord. I know he's risen. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. That's how I know he lives. But uh, Jesus proved he was Lord when he rose from the grave, and he had over 500 eyewitnesses at one time. I should have added up all these witnesses, but it was at least probably 525 or so eyewitnesses. But look, look at verse 14. Now he's fixing to appear to the 11. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them. Now that means scolded. He's scolding them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we see here the disciples are discouraged. They're the same way that you and I would have been. Uh, they're discouraged. They're poochy lipped. They're down in the mouth. They're depressed. And Jesus comes to him, and he says, I'm going to give you something to cheer you up. Go. All right? He says, go. Now, I am so thankful that the good shepherd knew that sometimes we as dumb sheep would have a tendency to wander off away from the shepherd. So he gave us a means to come back to the, Savior, to the shepherd's side. Now, turn to Revelation 2.4. Revelation 2, 4. Aren't you glad that the good shepherd knew 
that we would be, as the old song goes, prone to wander, prone to stray, prone to leave the God I love. He knew at times, the shepherd knew at times we'd be like Peter. Peter denied Jesus and the Bible says he followed him afar off. The good shepherd knew that sometimes things might get a little dry, things might get a little dusty, things might get a little stale, a little hum, humdrum in our Christian walk. You know, sometimes we might be like Peter. We might not be following as close as we should. We not, might not be as excited and as zealous about the things of God as we should. So Jesus uh, gave us a way to fix that. God told Peter to feed his sheep. And that would get his love back. He said, Peter, feed my sheep. And the same goes for us. He's given us a way to get our love back. He's given us a way to get back close to the shepherd. Look at Revelation 2.4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You know, the Bible says here, when you lose your first love, do your first works. And I've taught about it over and over again. First works are soul winning. The first thing Jesus did when he came on the scene was preach the gospel. First thing John the Baptist did when he came on the scene was preach the gospel. The first thing Jesus did, call his disciples to do. Uh, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, was, was uh, preaching the gospel. That's the first works. The first works are always preaching the gospel. When things get dry, when things get dusty, when things get stale, aren't you glad God, God gave us a recipe? Just go keep somebody out of hell. Amen. When things get stale, go keep somebody out of hell. Amen. And look, if you're keeping people out of hell every week, things will never be stale for long. Let that sink in. You won't need a revival. If you're keeping people out of hell every week of your life, yeah, you may have a bad day or two during the week, but it ain't going to stay bad long. Amen. It ain't going to stay bad long. You will not need revival. You, be, you will live in a state of revival. Amen? Mm-hmm. If you are constantly about the Father's business, I'll have bad days. I have some days I don't even crawl out of bed. I have some days I feel like I'm one step ahead of the devil. But praise God, it don't last long. Amen? Those ruts don't last long. Now, a, a, a rut's nothing but a, a, a grave with the ends knocked out of it. How do you get yourself out of the rut? You go keep somebody out of hell. You go preach the gospel. Amen? Now look, this is the way we live in a state of revival. Pastor Anderson said recently, uh, you know, I, I thought it was pretty good. What he, I like, really like what he said. He said, you know, these Baptists already, it's big time down south. I, I grew up in it, so I know, I know what he's talking about. It's big time down south, this revival thing. You know, to have a spring revival, fall revival. A lot of times they have uh, a guest evangelist come and try to, pump some life into the dead church members and, and breathe some fire into them and, and get them on moss backs up and get them on moss backs moving and get them on moss backs doing something, saying amen and, and, you know, and doing something for the Lord. You try to encourage them, motivate them to go soul winning. And what Pastor Anderson said recently, you know, you got on it like, like Georgia, for example. Ain't no telling how many Baptists there, independent fundamental Baptist churches are praying for revival, pray for revival, pray for revival. And then he has a soul in a marathon and brings revival to Atlanta, Georgia, and brings a revival with young people from all over North America, Canada, and everywhere else, bringing a soul in a revival to Georgia, and they say, oh, don't have nothing to do with them. Don't have, I mean, revival's there. Revival's knocking at your door, and you're turning it away because you don't want nothing to do with it. You know, they don't want any part of it. Here's what, here's what they want. Here's what they mean by revival. They want to get some tingles and some chill bumps running up and down their spine. And, and, and they want to stay in the church house and pray and tell God about men instead of going out and telling men about God. That's their idea of revival. And look, and I'm telling something. You can have chill bumps big enough that a piglet can suck on them. And if you're not out telling somebody about Jesus and soul winning to keep people out of hell, you're not having revival, friend. There's no way you can have revival if you're not willing to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Every time they got full of the Holy, full of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, they were going out preaching the Word of God. Amen. Now turn to verse 16. Verse 16. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I'm definitely going to have to spend some time here in this verse. <laughs> because this verse right here is, oh man, there's been a lot of confusion about this verse. And this is the baptismal regeneration crowd's favorite verse. This is like Church of Christ's favorite verse here. And it's almost as if the Lord put a few verses in here to be stumbling blocks for people who, who just absolutely refuse to believe in salvation by grace through faith. And they want to have something to do with it. They got to get in there and, and try to manipulate it. And, and they got to get in there and try to, you know, I, man, I got to have something to do with my salvation. I, I, got, I got to have something to do with it. They just can't let it go. They just can't say, Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. So it's like Jesus actually puts a few verses in here to, to give them something to play with. Because, I mean, Jesus wants you to believe in salvation by grace through faith. And if you reject that, you can find any verse in the Bible to believe anything you want to believe. I can prove to you right now, and I could justify sodomy to you from the Bible if I wanted to justify it. Hey, you know what? The Bible says during the rapture, two men shall be lying in one bed. One shall be taken, the other one left. Hmm, what were they doing in the same bed together? <laughs> you, know, you know, hey, the Bible says Jonathan loved David. Had, Jonathan's love had more love for David than even a woman. Or was it vice versa? Was it Jonathan loved David or David loved Jonathan? David, David, I think Jonathan. Jonathan loved David more than even a woman, he said. So, you know. <laughs> but you see how a, you could make, you see how you could twist Scripture to make it say anything you want. You could lift one Scripture out of the Bible and ignore the whole of Scripture and make it say anything you want it to say. And that's why we've got so many cults. Now, like again, this is the Church of Christ go-to verse. They ignore the whole of Scripture. They reject the whole of Scripture and just single out this one little verse here. And see, when a saved person, when the Holy Spirit reads something like this, here's what they say. Well, I don't, I don't really understand what this is trying to say, really. I, I don't really understand what it's trying to say. But I know this. There's no way this one verse contradicts John 6, 3, 16. I don't fully understand what this is trying to say, but there's one thing I do know. Is that this verse does not contradict the greatest verse in all the world, John 3, 16. No way, no how. Now, I'll just move on and just keep reading because the problem's with my understanding. The problem's not with God's Word. That's what a normal person would say who has the Holy Spirit. But an unsafe person will take that and run with it. Now, let me deal with what it doesn't mean. This is not saying that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. I'm going to get to what it means, what I believe it means here, but first let me deal with what it doesn't mean. Number one, I'm going to tell you what, some reasons why. It cannot mean that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Number one, because it contradicts hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses. You know, especially one we, one we just read about, the thief on the cross. We just read about the thief on the cross where he was saved. And was it Mark 15? But when you confront the church of Christ and when you confront these people about that, well, what about the thief on the cross? They'll tell you that after Jesus rose from the grave, now there's a different dispensation. And now you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But here's what they don't understand. First of all, dispensation doesn't mean a period of time. Second of all, they don't understand that there has never has been a dispensation for salvation. Salvation's always been the same and always will be the same. You never were saved by the law. All right? Never. Abraham believed it was counted unto him as righteousness. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, let me just quote some scriptures for you that says and proves that we're saved the same way after Jesus died as we were saved before Jesus died and rose from the grave. John 20, 31. Now, John 20, 31. Is John 20, Jesus, I believe, rose from the grave in John 19, 18 or 19. 
But I guarantee you one thing, John 20 is definitely after Jesus rose from the grave. All right, so listen to John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name, proving that we're saved by believing after Jesus rose from the grave. Again, Acts 10, 43. Now, Acts is definitely way past Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, that's in a whole another book of the Bible. A whole other another book after the resurrection. That's in Acts. Jesus rose from the grave in, in, in Mark 16. Now we're all the way into Acts chapter 10. So obviously it's after he rose from the grave. Acts 10 43 says, To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now let me ask you a question. Romans chapter 4 verse 5. Is Romans after the resurrection or before the resurrection? After the resurrection. Romans 4 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. No, no dispensation for salvation, saved by believing in Christ before the resurrection, saved by believing in Christ after the resurrection. So that's the first reason why this is not saying you've got to be baptized to be saved. Number two, unbelief is what condemns a person not, not being baptized. I mean, Jesus spells it out right here in this same verse in Mark 16. He says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So he specifically tells us what damns a person. What damns a person is not believing, not not being baptized. Not, not being baptized does not damn you. Not believing is what damns you, all right? So he specifically clears it up in that same verse. All you got to do is keep reading that same verse to see that it's not, that baptism doesn't save or damn a person. It's belief. I'll give you a third reason why that can't mean you have to be baptized. Uh, can't mean you have to be baptized in order to be saved, because Paul said, "For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel." Amen. Now, don't you think that if you had to be baptized to be saved, Paul would have been pushing baptism? And Paul did baptize a few, but that was not the focus of his ministry, because he was not a he was not a uh, Paul was not a, a deacon or Paul was not a pastor. He was not a bishop. So that's the reason why Paul's not baptizing a lot of people here. He was leaving that up to the local church. He was leaving that up so, so they could be baptized into the body. They could be baptized in the local church, and now they've got a church family. So that's why Paul wasn't out doing a lot of baptisms. He did baptize some, you know, in the situation. You know, and, and, and one of our church members asked me one time, says, you know, what happens if I was up at Canyon Lake or something, and, uh, you know, I led somebody to the Lord, and... Uh, do you think it would be appropriate for me to baptize them? And here's what I told him. I said, well, it would be better if you brought them to the church because now if they're baptized at church, now they've got a body they can identify with. But, you know, if you're in a worst case scenario and they were, you know, they lived in a, you know, Iraq and there was no Christians over in Iraq and they're getting ready to fly somewhere. I said, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd baptize them then. You, you had to baptize them then. But if you can get them to church and bring them to church, you need to get them baptized at church so they can identify with that local body, be baptized into that local body. But anyway, Paul wasn't doing that uh, much. He did do it some. But um, the third reason was Paul said, uh, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Look, you better believe that if baptism was necessary for salvation, Christ would have sent Paul to do that as well. Number four, the fourth reason is, the only time in the entire Bible the question was ever asked, what must I do to be saved? Baptism is never mentioned. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's the only time that question is ever asked in the entire Bible. What must a person do to be saved? Baptism is never mentioned. Okay, you say, well, Brother Manley, what does it mean then? If it doesn't mean you have to be baptized in order to be saved, what's the point? What does it mean? When it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I believe it's just a simple statement. It's not a condition for salvation, it's a statement. Now you could make a similar statement like, he that believeth and joins the church shall be saved. He that believeth and goes soul winning shall be saved. He that believeth and takes communion shall be saved. He that believeth and giveth tithes shall be saved. He that believeth and says the sinner's prayer shall be saved. Because guess what? He that believeth and does anything shall be saved. <laughs> Anytime you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. 
But look, when someone is willing to say the sinner's prayer with you, or someone is willing to get baptized after you give them a good thorough presentation of the gospel, that's normally a good surefire evidence they got it. That's proof that they got it. Now, it's good to get proof and good to understand that somebody's really saved. That way you can move on and try to get somebody else saved. You know, if they got it, then let's move on. Let's, let's shift our focus to them towards discipleship. And let's shift our focus on evangelism, getting somebody saved somewhere else. They got it. Let's move on. So that's why it's good. And I believe Jesus is saying here, hey, that, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized, you can believe that person right there is saved. Especially back in those days. Because that was during the time of persecution. And you, you could believe, you better believe that if somebody was willing to be publicly baptized and jeopardize persecution, that was good evidence that they had been saved. Amen? Uh, let's see here. Again, baptism is not a condition, but a token that they actually do believe and trust in Christ. It means they, they, they meant business. They're willing to get baptized. Baptized, that means they meant business. And you guarantee it, they're saved. They're sh they shall be saved. Now hold your place in Mark and turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. See, the Bible says the like figure whereunto, where, where unto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism is a figure of what we're saved by. It's a picture of what we're saved by. It's a picture of what took place. I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And baptism just pictures that. Just because, look, you don't have to put on a wedding ring to be married. But when you get married, you put on a wedding ring to show everybody, hey, I'm married now. You don't have to be baptized in order to get saved. But when you get saved, you get baptized to show, hey, everybody, I'm a believer now. I trust in Jesus. I'm, a, I'm a, his follower and I'm a, not ashamed. Look at verse 7. Or, uh, hold your place in 1 Corinthians 14. Now hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 14. And also, let's look at uh, Mark. Let's go back to Mark 16. I had you turn there a little early, but that's fine. Just hold your place. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Now go, let's go back where it says, in these signs. Underline that word, signs. I don't know that word right there in verse 17, signs. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Now let me stop right here and talk about this tongues thing. When it says new tongues, this is new to the one speaking it. This doesn't mean some new language, like some, uh, some uh, ancient language that's been resurrected or some new language that nobody knows yet. Or not, this is not talking about jibber-jabber. This is a new tongue. It's new to the person who's speaking it. If, I, if the Holy Ghost came on me and I started speaking fluent German, it would be a new tongue for me because it's not my tongue. Tongue just means language. It's not my language. This is, when it says new tongue, it's not an angelic language. It's not jibber-jabber. All right, Verse 18, And they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on, the right hand, and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs. Now underline that again in your Bible. Signs following. Amen. Now hold your place there and turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. You should be there already. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. These early Christians had certain sign gifts from God. I, I, I believe all early Christians, after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, for a short, limited period of time, got sign gifts from the Lord. And I'll prove that to you. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign... Underline sign. There it goes again. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So are tongues something that's supposed to be done in the church to edify the body of Christ? Is tongues something that's supposed to be done in the church because it's an angelic heavenly language and you're, you just want to get closer to the Lord? 
No, tongues had one purpose. It was a sign to those who did not believe so they would believe. Let's keep reading. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe, not but for them that believe. Now prophesying in the context here is talking about the prophesying or preaching in the church. Now, there is a prophesying that is for those who don't believe. That's the gospel when we go door to door, house to house. But the context here is in the church, because look at verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. So, obviously the context here is in the church. So, prophesying in the church is for who? Those who believe or don't believe? Believe. 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 That's why we don't preach salvation in church. That's why you're not going to come here every Sunday and hear a salvation message. Because a salvation, salvation message is for those who don't believe. The prophesying that needs to happen in the church is for those who do believe. We preach salvation door to door, house to house. You don't need salvation message every week. You've already got it. That's why a lot of churches have watered down they're preaching and trim their preaching and they don't preach thus saith the Lord because they've tailored their church services to the lost. And your church services should be tailored to the saved to equip the saints to go out and preach the gospel in the street. Preaching to unbelievers should not be done in the church house. It should be done door to door, house to house. Now, I may, do, I may preach a salvation message in church once or twice a year you know, when we get in a building, I, I want to have a couple big days where we have family friend days. You know, Thanksgiving, I, I want to give away frozen turkeys. All, all first-time visitors get a free turkey. We don't have the room for it now. But eventually, I want to have a, uh, a, 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 you know, some big days, family and friend days and things, a couple times a year. And then I may, may tailor my message toward a salvation message, you know, a couple times a year. But it's not going to be every Sunday morning like a lot of churches that uh, these days. But anyway here, let me get back to the point here. Verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and are come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? So right there when it says, and there come in those who are unlearned, that proves right there that tongues is not jibber-jabble. If, if, if everybody in your church is speaking in foreign languages, you know, if, if, if your preacher is standing up preaching in an, a new tongue, he's, he's basically preaching with the Holy Spirit's anointing on him where he's preaching in a foreign language, and people come in who are unlearned in that language. See, you can't be learned in jibber-jabber. There's no way to learn jibber-jabber. All right? So this proves right here that there's no such thing as jibber-jabber tongues in church. It says, if they come in who are unlearned. So that means they come in and they don't know Spanish. They come in and they don't know German. Or unbelievers come in. If unbelievers come in and hear this bunch of... I got a sermon I I'm going to preach one day. It's called a black, the, a black Cloud to the Gospel. Look, we're weird enough to the world. We're weird enough. Because of, you know, the way we dress and the way we don't... Things we say and don't say and you know, places we go and don't go and... And you know, things we believe, we're weird enough. We don't need to be going around talking like turkeys. <laughs> and flopping around in the aisles and, you know, hissing like a snake and bo or, or barking like a dog and oinking like, oinking like a pig and having laughing revivals and this bunch of Tom foolishness in the house of God. Where it says, thou oughtest know how to behave thyself in the house of God. And it says, everything, let everything be done decently in order. I got a whole sermon I want to preach on that someday. It's called uh, A Black Cloud to the Gospel. That's really put a, 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 that's really hindered the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Tom foolishness of a bunch of jibber jabber turkey talk in churches. It's made us look like a bunch of kooks. But look here. It says, would they not say that you are mad? Would they not come in and think you're mad? They'll think you're crazy. And they got every right to think people are crazy for believing that nonsense. I've been in church and they did it and I thought they were crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They are. Now look down at, um, look down at Hebrews 2.4. Let's look at Hebrews 2.4. Hebrews 2.4. <clears throat> we saw in Mark where it says, 
They went forth to preach to everywhere the Lord, working with them and confirming the word with signs following. I'm talking to you about sign gifts. I'm talking to you about how the early Christians had these sign gifts. They had certain miracles to confirm the word of God. It tells us right there in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, why they had these certain signs. They had these sign gifts to confirm the word of God. Hebrews 2, 4 says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Bearing them witness, okay? Giving them proof. Confirming God's word. That's what he's doing here. See, here's the whole, here, here, here's the big picture. They did not have a King James Bible. Now, when I go up to someone and tell them, you know, the Bible says for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. You know, I start going through the Romans road with them. I start going through the gospel. I start telling them, hey, you cannot be saved unless you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Okay, well, well by what authority do you tell me these things? I tell you by, based on authority of the King James Bible. I'm telling you based because thus saith the Lord. I'm telling you because I hold the pure and precious and incorruptible Word of God here in my hand. That's why I can tell you, you have to be born again. It said the man be born again, he should not see the kingdom of God. It's because God said it, and I hold it right here. I got proof. Guess what? They didn't have that proof. They couldn't go up to somebody and say, well, the King James Bible says so. They couldn't hold, they couldn't stand on the authority of the Word of God like we can today. So, what they would do is, if they went up to somebody and witnessed to them and was telling them, hey, except a man be born again and you should not enter the kingdom of God, you've got to put all your trust and hope and faith in Jesus Christ. They'd say, by what authority do you say that? I'll tell you by what authority I say that. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. They confirmed their word by signs that they had. They confirmed their word by gifts that they had, by certain sign gifts that God gave them. Or maybe because of the fact that, uh, you know, all of a sudden they start speaking fluent Greek or Spanish. It'd be like, you know, me, if, uh, you know, if I go up and witness to a, let's go up and, uh, you know, and I start trying to order a burrito down in Mexico. I go up to a guy and I'm, I'm trying to order a burrito and I, you know, I'm butchering it and I'm, I'm messing up my language and I can't figure out how to ask for it and I'm having to point. This right here, this, this is what I want to point to the menu. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes over me. And I just start speaking fluent Spanish. I mean, like, better than poncho Spanish. <laughs> That's a sign gift. Amen? That person realizes that, and, and, and it, it could get them saved. Now, see, you say, well, why did God give these early Christians these sign gifts? And I'll prove to you in a minute. I, I believe all early Christians at one point in time, for a short period of time, had these sign gifts. All of them. Now, you say, well, why did God give these early Christians these sign gifts, and why doesn't He give it to us today? Well, number one, we've got the Word of God. We've got a more sure prophecy. We've got a more sure word of prophecy. We've got a complete Bible. They didn't. But see, you've got to understand Jesus gave him the great commission to go you know, to all the world. Now, that's a tall order to get the gospel to the entire world with no internet, no airplanes, no emails, no YouTube. Most of them probably didn't even have a donkey to ride on. Pat, they had Pat and Charlie. You know, they had... They had they had two feet. They had their Jerusalem cruisers. Their air, their air, air Jesuses. They had their sneakers on. I mean, their sandals. They had their sandals on. That was it. Okay, so that's a pretty tall order to get the gospel to the world for 120, 120 people to get to God. That wouldn't be that big a deal for us today because we got airplanes, you know. I mean, it's still, it's still a tall order, but not, like, not, not to the, to the uh, measure it was for them. All right, so... God had to help him get this ball rolling a little bit. You know, God's got to jump start a little bit for him. You got to understand, thousands of people were saved by Jesus. Thousands of people were saved by John the Baptist. But there's only 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. That's, a, that's not a lot. 120 is not that big of a church. I mean, it's a good size. I hope we get to 120 one day. 
you know, but I mean, it's, but to get the gospel to the whole world, 120 people ain't, ain't, is not that many. So Jesus wants to get this thing kick-started. So he gave him these sign gifts to help him get going, to help confirm the word of God and help prove to people that what they were saying was the truth. Now, I do believe for a period of time all people had this because Mark teaches, listen to what Mark says, let me read it to you again. And these signs shall follow them that believe. So I believe for a short period of time, from the book of Mark to about sometime in 1 Corinthians or maybe sometime in the book of Acts, all believers receive these sign gifts. Because on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says all of them spake with tongues, even the women. All of them are speaking with tongues. And these signs were what helped get that 3,000 people added to the church to help jumpstart the church and jumpstart the spreading of the gospel throughout the world. You remember the Bible says all nations were, were, were present at the day of Pentecost. So that's how the, nation, the, the gospel started to spread throughout the whole world as a result of the day of Pentecost because all nations were present there. Now again, I believe the Bible teaches for a short time all believers had these gifts in Acts, but by the time we get to 1 Corinthians... Not all believers have these same gifts anymore. Because uh, that's why Paul said, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. So by the time we get to 1 Corinthians, not everybody's having these same sign gifts anymore. Probably the ones that were still alive, that got it during the book of Acts, probably still could get full of the Holy Spirit and could speak in, in, in unknown tongues. But not everybody could. So some point there was the cutoff. And now the people who were getting saved, the word had been confirmed enough. The word of God had been established enough. So that, by that point in time, not everybody's receiving this gift. All right, let me see where we're at here. Again, we don't have these signs today because we have a more sure prophecy. We have the whole word of God. And all the sign anybody will get today is the powerful word of God. God's plan is not for anybody to see any miracles, not to see any signs. But God's plan today is for him to hear the quick, powerful, sharp, two-edged sword of the Word of God and have their heart cut up and just believe it by faith. That's God's, that's God's plan today. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 13, verse 8. Let me prove to you, further prove to you that tongues have ceased. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. We see tongues have ce ceased because Paul said, I would that you all speak in tongues, and they weren't all speaking in tongues at that point in time. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. And we're done with Mark, so you, can, you don't have to hold your place or anything. I want to prove to you a lot of confusion about this chapter here. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now I've heard a lot of preachers preach that tongues have ceased because now we have that which is perfect. They say that because we have the Word of God, we have that which is perfect, and tongues have ceased. But that's not true. That which is perfect is not the Word of God. It cannot be the Word of God because when that which is perfect is come, knowledge also vanishes away. And prophesying, what does it say? Whether there be tongues that are seized, be knowledge that shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Okay? Is knowledge done away? No, we still need knowledge. Is prophecy, prophesying done away? No, we still need to preach. We still need to prophesy. That which is perfect is referring to Jesus Christ when He comes and sets up His millennial reign on earth. Because when He comes and sets up His millennial reign on earth, there's going to be no need to preach anymore. Because everybody's going to be saved. All Israel shall be saved. Everybody that lives in Israel is going to be the saved. There's going to be no need to have knowledge of God anymore because we're going to see Him face to face. We can ask Him what we want to ask Him. We're going to have uh, an enlightened knowledge then. But what I do want you to notice here is Tongues ceasing is not dependent upon that which is perfect. Tongue ceases on its own. 
Prophesying and knowledge cease when Jesus comes, that which is perfect. But tongues is not dependent upon that which is perfect. Let's read it again, you'll see it. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now pay close attention to verse 9. Tongues is never mentioned in verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now was tongues ever mentioned? It wasn't. Prophecy and knowledge is the only thing that mentioned. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now, that which, is, uh, that which is in part is knowledge and prophesying. That is what is affected or influenced when that which is perfect is come. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is, is tongues is not influenced by Jesus coming. That died on its own. That had a purpose. It had a course. It finished its... It, had, it, 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 it did its task... It finished its course and it died off on its own, like an energizer battery. Man, it just, it just died. Knowledge and prophesying is dependent upon Jesus Christ. Knowledge and preaching have not ceased. Now let me show you in the Bible, Jeremiah 31, 34. Let's turn to Jeremiah 31, 34. And I'm going to show you why knowledge and prophesying will cease in the millennial reign of Christ. Does that make sense? Tongues ceased on its own. It was a sign gift. It had its purpose to confirm the word of God. It's not, it's not happening anymore, folks. And if it was happening, it wouldn't be happening like we see in churches today where you got a bunch of women up doing it. When the Bible says specifically in the context of tongues, women shall remain silent in the church. When the Bible says, you know, one shall stand up and it shall be interpreted. You know, somebody who knows Spanish will actually interpret it so the whole body can get something from it. And it's not just up somebody puffing out their tail feathers, wandering around saying, hey, look at me, everybody. And nobody gets anything out of it. It says that it should be done in turn. One will stand up, speak tongues. It's interpreted. He'll sit down. I believe the Bible says you can't, there's only, you can't have any more than two tongue speaking sessions in a church service. I believe it's two or three. I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to really go into this much detail on it. I, I got a whole sermon. I'm going to do that in the future. But uh, I was just trying to buy some time while you turned to thir Jeremiah 31. 34, are you there yet? Jeremiah 31, 34. If tongues was to be done or was still being done today, it's definitely, it wouldn't be the way we see it. All right? Yeah. It'd be somebody going down to Mexico and get full of the Holy Spirit and speaking fluent Spanish. Or it'd be, you know, we got some church visitors one day, just people stopped by. They came and visited. And, uh, or, or it'd be like, you know, how many times we knock a door and somebody comes to the door and they don't know Spanish? Oh, we'll, we'll come to church anyway because Brother Manley gets full of the Holy Ghost and a lot of times he starts speaking in Spanish. <laughs> you know? He might, he, might give you, he, might, he might give you a five or ten minute Spanish you know, uh, sermon wrap up. And, uh, so that's how it would be today if it was still going on. Jeremiah 31, 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. No need to teach. No need to preach. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. That's why there's not going to be any knowledge. Uh, we're not going to need to be prophesying or preaching about the knowledge of Jesus in the millennial reign because everybody there is going to be saved. All Israel shall be saved. All the spiritual Israel. Are, Israel is going to be made up of saved people. Spiritual Israel is going to be made up of saved people. It says here, From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I forgive their iniquity, and I remember their sin no more. Does everybody see that? And it says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Not going to have to preach. Hey, that's why we better share the God. Hey, a thousand years, you know, we all love preaching the gospel, and we all enjoy it. Well, we better do as much of it now as we can. Because yeah. a thousand years, we're not going to be able to do it. There ain't going to be any need to do it. And there's one thing you can't do in heaven. is share the gospel with an unbeliever. Because there is no unbelievers. That's right. So I uh, hope that helps you there. Let's go ahead and pray.